urban legend says that black children were used as alligator bait during the 19th and early 20th centuries. At first, I thought this was an anomaly or something. Maybe like a tall tale of hunters bragging about hunting apex predators. But then I saw it over and over again. And now, I can't unsee it. This is real. This is dark. It is disgusting the lengths humans will go to to hurt each other. And it is terrifying how deep the racism in the United States goes. This is what I want to share with you today. My point is not to make you feel bad, but to help us understand the brutality and sheer depravity of our history. It reminds me of one of my favorite quotes by Martin Luther King Jr. We are not makers of history. We are made by history. It's a chant that has reverberated around the swamp for at least a quarter century, but the gator bait chant will no longer be endorsed by the University of Florida because of its origins. Back in 2020, the University of Florida banned its band and athletes from using the gator bait cheer. This was a part of a larger initiative to remove any symbols or association with the cheer's racist history. In 1996, after winning against their rival Florida State University, Lawrence Wright said, If you ain't a gator, you must be gator bait. While the cheer itself is not racist, the phrase is. The phrase gator bait is connected to old stories about black children being used as bait for alligators. This was reported in many publications in the early 1900s, and there are some records to back it up. In the 1800s to 1900s, alligator hunting was a big business, a lucrative trade. The skin from these animals was used to make belts, bags, shoes, and other highly sought after products. The white settlers saw the land and its wealth as unlimited. So, they would continuously deplete its resources, whether that meant mining, agriculture, or hunting wildlife. Crocodile and alligator hunting was a highly popular sport in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Among all exotic leathers, both alligator and crocodile skins were very expensive and well-like products. But the only way to get these skins was to hunt wild animals. And since the demand for the raw material went up, the rich were willing to pay good money for it. This meant more and more people were eager to take the deal. In the 19th century, people used rifles, muskets, and shotguns. Now, I'm not talking about the fast-loading, quick-shooting type of weapons we use today. This is 19th century technology that uses simpler and older mechanisms. In most cases, you would have to load the muzzle with gunpowder before you could aim and shoot. A lot of people without military experience could only manage to shoot two shots per minute. Some weapons that use the mini ball, which is a low hollow based bullet, were made to load faster. But even with weapons such as these, alligator hunting was never easy. White hunters would often lose an arm or a leg, and in some cases, their lives, trying to catch and kill these predators. So they decided to use bait that would lure the alligators from the swamps and turned them into easy prey. But this was no ordinary bait. Some say small black children were often used as bait to catch these apex predators. This might have happened in Louisiana, Florida, and any other parts of the South. White men would come to steal the babies, sometimes in broad daylight, at other times, when the mothers weren't looking, and take these children to the swamp, put them in pens, or tie them with a rope and leave them right next to an alligator's den. In a matter of minutes, the alligators would come out and go after their prey. This is brutal, gut-wrenching. This is a vintage postcard from Florida. It depicted the horrible image of white people using children as alligator bait. Such a deep level of racism was highly prevalent in the American South and was often used to attract tourists, making it a hotspot for white hunters. During the Jim Crow era, African Americans lived a horrible life. They were often mistreated, beaten, and killed in the most brutal way imaginable. If there was a way to oppress, maim, murder, or use black people, they would find it. The atrocities were endless, and they were a part of normal life. Some reports show that black children being used as alligator bait really happened. It happened to real people. Even though it might not have been a highly common practice, it did happen in some regions, especially in the South. It is hard to even process how someone can think of something like that. But for the deformed and deranged human mind, atrocities such as these were deemed normal. That's because black people were seen as subhuman, worthless, and savage and the lives of animals were considered more valuable than that of a black human child. Experts found a couple of news articles published in the 19th and 20th centuries. These written pieces contained evidence of this horrible activity. The children who were used as bait were probably not infants. They were taught to run out, sit, or make noises just at the right moment. 
When the alligator would burst out of its hiding place, the hunters would shoot. This created the perfect opportunity to catch the alligator off guard. Here's an article from the Washington Times from 1908. The word pickaninny is used to refer to a black child. This was a stereotype used to demean black children. White people used the term when they wanted to talk about something almost inhuman, unkept, and filthy. It was something dispensable. This was a common depiction even in popular media. The article talks about a zookeeper sending two black children into a paddock with more than 25 alligators and crocodiles. The hungry reptiles started chasing the children. This was a tactic they used to lead the reptiles back into their tank so that the tourists could view the animals in the summer. But there is more. Here is another article, this time from Richmond Times Dispatch, issued in 1919. Here, in this mini-story, we can see that the white community was not really happy with Florida authorities' decision to ban the use of African American children as gator bait. Then, it goes on to mock these children as if it was their fault for the sudden disappearance of alligators because they supposedly ate the pickaninnies and had digestive problems as a result. This is just vile. Here's another article from St. Louis Republic, published in 1902. This one described all the floats featured in the Veiled Prophet Parade of the city. The Veiled Prophet organization was a secret society established by a former Confederate soldier. He organized this parade to depict the history of the Louisiana Purchase. Float number 15, titled Plantation Life in Louisiana, showcased a scene where a massive alligator was depicted devouring a chubby young African American child. Articles were not the only forms of content that would cover this horrible imagery of alligator baits. There are also postcards, branding, posters, and memorabilia, all providing the exact same thing. This is a postcard, and it is one of the many examples that show black children being used as alligator bait. In the United States, these early postal cards were the text messages of their time. They were cheap and practical to make and could reach a wide range of audience. At the time, they were meant to be mailed as commercial ads. Many of these postcards were printed with small designs or sketches called vignettes. They had a message on the side. At first, the cards were made just in black, but in time, they became increasingly available in color. The many surviving examples of such postcards tell a horrendous story. They were meant to address the people willing to use the lives of black children to collect a prized commodity, alligator skin. The white hunters were using human blood and flesh to lure monstrous crocodiles and alligators. To prepare for the activity, it is said that some white people kidnapped black children, tied them to a string, and dropped them in the swamps. Others would get groups of children and order them to stay over the alligator swamp, near the open mouths of hungry alligators. These children were fed to the predator's hole. This is a documented event that can also be seen in old artifacts, such as product packaging and knickknacks. Here is a classic example of household ornaments that were sold in areas where alligator baits were deemed a tourist attraction. At the time, the shelves and stores were covered with these decorative objects. These antiques come in bold colors and highly intricate designs that don't shy away from America's brutal past. Many of these trinkets are displayed in the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Imagery. This was a system built upon itself to create and keep a society stuck in a vicious cycle of racial hierarchy. The gator bait was also included in popular rhymes and songs. Take The Mammy's Little Alligator Bait by Henry Wise and Sidney Perrin, for example. This lullaby was published in 1899. The lullaby teaches readers to sing and play a song about the gator bait. I can only guess who was reading it. Probably white children. The lyrics are relatively simple and easy to follow, and the music appears to be easy to perfect. I can't even imagine to what lengths did white parents go to to shape and corrupt the minds of their children filling them up with ideas of pure hatred and racism, even before they were ready to understand right from wrong. Here is another example, this time a poem. This one gets to the point right away. It describes how a white hunter can't find a standard bait to catch a crocodile, but there are some black children playing around, which can serve as the perfect replacement. He can place the child on a hook and leave it to dangle over the swamps. The hunter waits, and the tempting bait does its job, and then swoops in for the kill. There's another book called Amos that talks about an alligator and black children. This book was published in 1957 in New York by the Comet Press Books. In this story, two young children of African American descent called Buttercup and Amos are playing in the swamp. They meet a crocodile named Snip Snip and the three become best friends. Now, this plot is the complete opposite of what we see in other stuff. The children play happily with the crocodile and there's no tragic ending. In the book, Amos and Buttercup embarked on an exciting journey alongside Snip Snip, even riding on the crocodile's back. The trio ventured into a cave where Buttercup felt frightened 
while Amos remained overly trusting. Inside the cave, they discovered Snip Snip's baby resting amidst a pool of treasures. The two friends named the baby crocodile, Nip Nip. Towards the story's end, Snip Snip kindly offered to give Amos and Buttercup a ride back home. In return, the crocodile mother asked them to keep their friendship a secret while promising to share her treasures with them. The story had a happy ending since no one met a tragic fate. However, the story did focus on classic stereotypes. The narrative did associate black children with dangerous reptiles, even if it didn't explicitly use them as bait. The gator bait is also represented in product packaging. Take a look at the branding for this soap and candy product. These anti-black images were often used to perpetuate racial stereotypes and reinforce white supremacy. They were used in various forms of advertising and marketing, including product packaging, advertisements, and promotional materials. These images were meant to dehumanize black children, and it worked. By depicting black children as nothing more than baits, the white community could normalize their harmful and negative perceptions. This was used to convince people that these children had no rights and didn't deserve their respect. It was a way of normalizing and promoting behavior that would deny them basic human rights and dignity. Now, these stories about gator bait, without a doubt, reveal a deeply disturbing racism that was widespread in the American South. But many people believe that it is very unlikely that this thing actually happened. Although alligators can eat humans, they prefer to eat small mammals, snakes, turtles, rough fish, and birds. Given the choice, they would hunt for prey that's readily available. The egret apparently has eyes only for the stick. And the alligator has snagged the chef's special. Secondly, these news stories, books, poems, and lullabies come from third-hand accounts. They were clearly designed to appeal to a profoundly racist audience that found these tales amusing. So, they might have been written to appeal to the market base, or they could have been passed down from generation to generation as word of mouth tales. Also, children, even of African American descent, were still worth money. So, it would be unreasonable to take them to a swamp and tie them up to attract alligators. These children would still be valuable to the owner. They cost money. Would a slave owner want a handicapped worker? Not really. Sad, but true. A chicken would be a better bait. It would cost next to nothing and can get the job done. But when I think about the lynchings, breeding farms, and all the horrible things that black people went through, it is easy to imagine how the bait stories are just another part of our dark history. After the Civil War, the United States created a law to protect the rights of previously enslaved African Americans. But the Jim Crow laws were specifically designed to undermine and disregard these rights. From the 1870s to the 1960s, Jim Crow laws enforced a cruel racial hierarchy in the southern states. These laws deliberately bypassed the protections established after the Civil War, including the 15th Amendment, which granted black men the right to vote 150 years ago. These discriminatory laws stripped black people of their rights, subjected them to public humiliation, and perpetuated their economic and educational marginalization. Anyone who challenged this social order faced ridicule, harassment, and even violence. The term Jim Crow originated in the 1820s when a white comedian named Thomas Rice created a character named Jim Crow. This stereotypical character became a common feature in minstrel shows and was also used as a derogatory nickname for black people. After the Civil War, the 13th Amendment officially ended slavery. However, white Americans in the former Confederacy opposed emancipation. They swiftly took action to deprive black people of their newfound freedoms. They enacted black codes, modeled after previous slave laws, which denied black individuals various rights, such as owning property, freedom of movement, and opening a business. These codes were meant to recreate a similar dynamic to the forbidden master-slave relationship. When the North retaliated, Congress passed constitutional amendments known as the Reconstruction Amendments. These amendments aimed to ensure the freedom and civil rights of formerly enslaved people. The 14th Amendment granted citizenship and equal protection under the law, while the 15th Amendment prohibited the denial of voting rights based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Southern states were required to ratify these amendments to be readmitted to the Union However, while states reluctantly complied with federal law, they made minimal efforts to abolish the black codes. Meanwhile, any black person who would dare challenge the status quo would get beaten or murdered by groups like the Ku Klux Klan. So, I think that the gator stories hold some truth. To catch and trap a gator, hunters would need a bait that's kicking and thrashing, one that would make a lot of noise and draw the gators in. To be honest, I think that racists during the slave times in Florida and Louisiana would have easily done this. White people didn't want more black people to be born in their communities, and they were already used to traumatizing African Americans. 
so they would see this as a simple way of getting what they want, to make a point. In times like these, this would have been allowed. There would be no repercussions. Back then, it was impossible to arrest, charge, or prosecute a white man for doing anything against a black man. When there are people in this world that you would rather see suffer, you could orchestrate an event that would spread fear throughout the entire country. The gator bait would have served its purpose. There are different ways people have harvested alligators over the years. But with the invention of firearms, alligator hunting became a popular practice in the United States, especially in the South. Some stories, however, claim that there is a possibility that black children were used as bait. They were kidnapped and tied down next to a swamp so that white hunters could take the shot. This is a tough pill to swallow. For many people, the alligator bait concept is difficult to accept, and for good reason. No one likes to see children getting slaughtered, let alone believe that alligator baits were a common practice. So, it is much easier to believe that this is the result of mere folklore or anecdotal myths. But if a number of newspapers, postcards, books, and trinkets depicted the story, how can we say that this didn't happen? While we can't know for sure, we can definitely say that the colonizers ended the lives of countless black people. It ruined the lives of many and left both children and adults irreparably scarred. This is the kind of history that shouldn't be forgotten. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Subscribe for more content like this. Until next time.